Well, this is part two of why uh, tube amps sound different. Uh, welcome back, and uh, in this part we're going to talk about transformers primarily and a few other things. So as you remember in part one, we looked at the fact that tube amps have their output stages coupled to the speaker through an output transformer. Now, there are ways to do that other than transformers, but 99%, maybe even a higher percentage of all the tube amps out there, whether they're hi-fi amps or guitar amps or uh, PA amps uh, or public address amps, whatever the amp is, they almost all use transformers in their output stage. So what you see on the screen is a sweep of the primary of an audio output transformer. The secondary is uh, open, and if you don't understand or don't have a basis in uh, transformers, one thing you might want to do is go back and look at my video on uh, transformers for tube circuits, but I'm going to review the, the things you need to know from that video uh, in a little bit. So you don't really need to go back and watch that. I think you can just watch this and you'll get as much out of it. This is aimed at someone who may know little about transformers or may know a little bit more about transformers, but has always wondered what is the effect on tube amps. Well, what you see is the impedance, which is basically the resistance to an alternating current of the transformer. On the left you see a, uh, a frequency, and by the way impedance varies with frequency. So on the left you see 200 Hertz here, and in the center this is about uh, 5 kilohertz. Over here is 100 kilohertz, and 200 kilohertz on the far right. So what do you see? Well, the impedance rises pretty much on a straight line with a little bit of a curve here to a peak at about 5 kilohertz or a little more. Uh, kilohertz is just a thousand hertz, by the way. And then the impedance begins to go down. It reaches a minimum of less than 2,000 ohms out here a little beyond 100 kilohertz. Then it rises again to somewhere over 10 kilo ohms and then drops off again. Now uh, in a second I'm going to show you uh, how I got this change, but what I'm going to do is this is a push-pull transformer. So it has two windings uh, for a primary, or I, you could say it has a tapped uh, primary with two windings. So what I'm going to do now is I'm looking at one side of the primary. I'm now going to switch over to the other side. And you notice a substantial difference. By the way, the uh, trace at the bottom is the phase. I'm not going to talk about the phase but for those of you that understand phase angle and uh, those sorts of things, you, you can get a lot of information from the phase diagram. But what you should also notice is that the impedance of this transformer changes dramatically, uh, this winding. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, variations in the transformer itself and also what it's connected to. Remember I said that the secondary is open. In other words, there's no load on this transformer. So what you see out at the end here are uh, high frequency effects. They are uh, present in all transformers and when you connect a transformer in the circuit, the circuit has effects, particularly at high frequencies. The reason is the inductance in the primary 
varies with or remains constant except that it has small capacitances in parallel with it. And at certain frequencies, those capacitances resonate to either raise the effective impedance or lower it. Don't worry if this seems strange to you if you haven't seen studied resonant circuits. Just take my word for it that when you get out in the very high frequency area, very high audio frequency area, in other words, anything above about 20 kilohertz, some various effects of the circuit begin to uh, begin to affect the, the results. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect a 10 ohm resistor to the secondary. And we'll let it run. And you notice how, how much better behaved it appears to be. Now it still has some of these bad effects out there, but the impedance now goes from about 3K to about uh, 12 or 15K ohms, and then back to about uh, 5K ohms or so. Now let's look at the other winding. Let it recalibrate. There we are. And you'll notice the other winding. While it has a completely different kind of characteristic out here, the, the characteristic over most of the audio range is pretty much the same as the other one. It starts at about 3K, goes up to about uh, 15K, and by the way, this thing scales, so don't be uh, don't be fooled by the fact that this curve may look a little different. You have to pay attention to the numbers. It's about 3K at 200 hertz, about 15K at 5 kilohertz, and then falls off dramatically out beyond 100 kilohertz, and then there's a peak again. Okay, let's take a look at some uh, mild introduction to transformer theory. Before we uh, delve into a, a mild inoculation of transformer theory, I thought you might like to see the setup that I'm working with here. On the right is a decade resistance box, and in a little bit we'll look at that box in terms of its impedance to see if it varies with frequency, because one of the things we're going to be talking about is the effect of primary and secondary impedances on each other and it's important that you have something that you can depend on to be relatively flat over the frequency range you're talking about to use as a standard. And this box is pretty good, so we'll show you that in a little bit. On the left is the analog discovery 2, which we're using for the impedance analyzer function. And then above that is a signal tracer a model 147, this actually is a 147A, uh, made by ICO, which if you watched my Frugal Repairman series, you know is one of the instruments that uh, we refurbished for the Frugal Repair Bench, uh, the, the radio workbench. Uh, the, this, well, I use this because it has a push-pull transformer let me show you a little of the uh, connections over here. The up here is the uh, is what I'm actually me measuring the impedance of. Notice that this says P B plus P. This is a tapped transformer, and this is the plate. B plus and plate that are used for uh, for an output transformer. Now only one side of this is actually used by the signal tracer. The reason that it uses that it has a uh, a full push-pull transformer is so it can be used as a test transformer by a technician, for example, working on a a radio. Back in the 30s especially, a lot of the radios, the better ones anyway, had push-pull output stages. And so it was important that you be able to substitute for the, for the output transformer 
in those stages, and for that you needed a tapped primary. The bottom is the secondary, and you may notice that it's uh, what's connected over here to the decade box, and let me get a little more light in there. You see that it says test amp and ground. When this, and by the way, this is not powered on. I'm just using the transformer. And there you can set switches in such a way that all you have is the transformer. So even though this is a, a signal tracer and contains a lot of circuitry, the only parts we're connected to is the transformer, and the transformer is connected to nothing else. So that's what we've been doing. Now, what we did with the impedance analyzer is we would look at one side and then we would look at the other side. So that's what you were saw, what you were seeing earlier, when we were uh, doing the impedance measurements. Okay, with that digression, now let's look at transformer theory. Okay, what is a transformer? Well, it's just two or more conductors, where the linking between them is not electrical; it is magnetic. So. When we talk about electromagnetism, there are two ways to transfer energy electromagnetically. One is by making a conductive connection, in which case the electrons flow, or the second is to link two conductors magnetically, which means you bring them close enough together that the magnetism created by one is uh, affects the other. Now, all conductors are linked magnetically with all other conductors and so on, so what we're talking about here practically is that you have to bring those conductors very close together, or you have to put a core material, something that, that tends to concentrate the magnetic field. You don't need to know a lot about that, except when we talk about audio transformers, we are always talking about transformers with some kind of metal core. The terminology I'm going to use here, or for those of you that may not have seen transformers, or it may have been a long time since you studied them, flux simply means the amount of magnetic energy that is that is linking the two conductors. So uh, you could see this with uh, a compass, for example. If you hold a compass near a magnet, the closer it gets to the magnet, the more the compass swings toward the magnet. Well, that means that the closer you get to the magnet, the higher the flux. Generally, we talk about a primary and a secondary. However, understand that these are arbitrary terms. Normally, the primary just means that's the source of the flux, and the secondary simply means that's the sink of the flux. In other words, that's where we, the primary is where we put in the power that creates the flux, and the secondary is where we take the power out. Now, I should point out that there is a linkage for direct current, but the uh, transformers are really only useful for alternating current. And in that case, the flux will vary. And it, uh, the primary flux will vary based on the current flowing in the primary. And the secondary flux will vary depending on how much flux is coupled from the primary and what else is connected to the secondary. So the flux produces a voltage difference. It produces a voltage difference, for example, if you apply a current to the primary, there's a voltage difference across the secondary if it's an AC uh, circuit. And, and that voltage difference allows for current flow. In other words, if we put a conductor, a resistor or some other conductor across the secondary, 
we can draw power out of the secondary because of the flux coupled. The core is the medium between the conductors. Now that can just be air and for RF coils and things of that sort a lot of times they are just air core. But at audio frequencies the core is usually a metal, often some kind of steel alloy or iron alloy uh, and it is often constructed in, in ways that we aren't going to get into but the core construction can be very complicated. Turns simply means the number of conductors through the core. So let me uh, show you one of those. Here is a, an iron core or at least a metal core transformer. It has a tapped winding on one side and it has just a, an ordinary winding on the other. What I mean by turns, you can see with this, this is simply a, a ferrite core and each time that, that the, the winding goes through the core, we count that as a turn. So if you count all the times that the, that the winding goes down this away from you through the core and wraps back, that's a turn. So there are a lot of turns around this uh, core. The turns ratio is the number of turns on one side. So for example, the number of turns on that are connected to these wires compared to the number of turns connected to these wires. And now for a little bit of math, Ohm's law for DC circuits is the voltage equals the current times the resistance. There is an Ohm's law for AC circuits that works very much the same way, except we replace resistance with impedance. And notice that this is frequency dependent. There is no frequency at DC, it is, it is a constant. So the at DC E equals IR and R doesn't ever vary. Because impedance varies with frequency, this uh, equation varies with frequency. The impedance, just by rewriting this equation, Z is equal to E divided by I, and so if you want to know the impedance at any frequency, if you measure the voltage and you measure the current at that frequency and you divide the current into the voltage, that gives you the impedance. The voltage ratio of a transformer is simply the turns ratio. So if there's a turns ratio here of 4 to 1, 4 on this side, one on this side. That means that the voltage ratio is also 4 to 1. Now, the current ratio is the inverse. In other words, the voltage on this side is 4 and the voltage on this side is 1. That means that if you put, uh, if there is 4 amps flowing on this side, there will be 1 amp flowing on this side. In other words, it's just the reverse of the turns ratio. Let me show you an example. Here we have shown one winding having four turns and another winding having two turns. Now, you can call one of these the primary and the other one the secondary, but once again it really just depends on normally which side you're putting the power into and which side you're taking the power out of. Let's assume this is the primary and this is the secondary. Let's assume the primary has four turns, secondary has two turns. Four volts on the, t on the primary means 2 volts on the secondary. It's just the ratio, the turns ratio. However, it's the exact opposite for the current. 4 amps in the secondary means 2 amps in the primary. Now let's look at what's called the, the impedance ratio, ZR. And the impedance ratio is the square of the turns ratio. Okay? And 
I think I skipped that when I was going up here. The impedance ratio is the turns ratio squared. So, for example, we have here a 4 ohm uh, or a 4 turn primary and a 2 turn secondary. The turns ratio is 2 to 1, 4 to 2. If we put a 1 ohm resistor in the secondary, it will look like 4 ohms to the primary. How did we get that? Well, remember, the turns ratio is 4 to 1, and the impedance ratio is, uh, I'm sorry, the turns ratio is 2 to 1, and the impedance ratio is the square of that. So the square of 2 is 4. So the impedance ratio is 4 to 1. That will become important a little bit later when we talk about how these transformers match a high output impedance of a tube to the low impedance of a speaker. Well, back to some practical experiments, and I hope that uh, whether you skipped forward or watched the theory section, uh, one of the problems with doing these videos is I always get comments from people, some of whom feel like I don't cover enough of the basics, and others who think that I do too much basics because they're a little more advanced. And so what I'm trying to do is to balance, but to allow those of you that have uh, all of the background in transformer theory, for example, to skip forward. So I'm going to try to do that in the future in videos so that I don't leave out the people who need the, the background or want to just review it, but at the same time I don't bore the rest of you too much. So if I haven't bored you already, let's move on with our experiments. You may recall we're using the Analog Discovery 2 and the Impedance Analyzer. And by the way, you can do Impedance Analyzer without this little add-on board. It just makes it more convenient. I won't get into all of that. I've done some videos on that in the past. But what we're doing is we're using the transformer in this signal tracer. And you may recall from Part 1 that we did some uh, scans of some speakers. To, to see what would what would work there. And we're using this uh, resistance box as a frequency flat load. So the first thing I want to do is I want to run the uh, speaker impedance curve just to refresh your recollection of what this speaker, now this is that Panasonic, and in a little bit we'll, we'll use the cost in case there's a uh, there's a slight difference. They're, they're different speakers, but they're basically the same quality. So let's take a look at the impedance curve of this speaker. Okay. You, you hear the uh, sound in the background. That's the, uh, the signal that the analog discovery is applying to the speaker. And this is the characteristic. You notice that it has a bit of a, a peak here, and then it uh, remains fairly flat, rising to uh, a pretty high uh, impedance, I think uh, over 50 ohms anyway, out in the 200 uh, kilohertz range. Once again, this is 200 hertz at the bottom, 200 kilohertz at the right. So. Uh, now, let's hook up that speaker to the transformer, but before we do that, we want to run the transformer with a flat load. Okay, now what you're seeing is the impedance of the transformer with a 10 ohm load. And you, you may have noticed the speaker, the nominal impedance of the speaker that I measure is around 10 ohms. Now, it's listed as a 6 ohm speaker but I'm going to use 10. It doesn't make a lot of difference in these measurements, but uh, the, if we were doing power measurements, it would matter, but for this purpose, it doesn't matter that we're not using the nominal rated impedance, and besides, this speaker doesn't seem to be as close to nominal as I would have expected it. But you see here that the uh, at 200 hertz, we're getting about a 3K impedance, and out, uh, let's say at 20 kilohertz, we're getting about 10K or 12K impedance. So now let's hook up the speaker and run the same thing. 
Okay, now we're running it with the speaker attached. And once again, it starts at about 3K. Rises to, I think what we did was we measured it at uh, along in here, but you notice now that it's going slightly higher. Now, the reason for that is that if you remember, the speaker is starting to increase its impedance at this same point. So not only are we seeing the effect of the transformer impedance, but we're also seeing the reflected speaker impedance. So that we're now going to about 20k ohm at 10 kilohertz. The reason that this is important, and by the way, you don't normally need to pay attention to things out here. In fact, I may uh, cut this off at uh, 100 kilohertz or something. But there are amplifiers, tube amplifiers, that are uh, that have transformers designed to go out into that range. Uh, the uh, okay, it, it's <laughs> it's auto scaling if you're noticing it jumping. Uh, it, it makes a decision based on the highest point on this curve and, and we're right on the borderline between two auto scales. At any rate, what I'm trying to show is that the combination of the transformer and the speaker is having an effect back in the, in the output stage of the amplifier, particularly a tube amplifier. And that matters. So let's talk about just a little bit. And then what I would like to do is talk briefly about push-pull amplifiers, because right now we're just going single-ended. Uh, one last thing I'll do here is I'll switch over and use the other winding. So unplugging from that winding, plugging into that winding. And you notice it's a little different, but essentially the same. It, it actually looks di uh, different out here, but in the normal pass band of audio, which is maybe 200 to, to 20 kilohertz, uh, <clears throat> it's basically the same. Okay, now let's, uh, let's take a look at why that's important in a tube amplifier, where it might not be as important in a uh, in a transistor amplifier. Here is a portion of the schematic for the signal tracer that I've been using with the uh, terminals labeled, in, in case uh, any of you want to look at the circuitry here. But the reason I'm showing this is to show how the uh, a typical, and this is a fairly typical output stage, uh, works through a transformer into a speaker. Now, I have removed this resistor for now. The purpose of this is simply to provide a load if you want to disconnect the speaker. And if you've ever worked in a radio repair shop and back in the day, you know why you do that. There's nothing worse than the guy next to you working on something with the speaker turned on. But anyway, uh, so what we've been uh, looking at is what is the effect of a speaker put across the secondary reflected into the primary? And the reason that's important is because it affects the operation of this tube. You may recall from part one that we talked about this situation where if you plot, and this, these are the characteristics of a triode, but the same thing is of course true for a pentode. If you plot the plate characteristics, that is plate voltage against plate current for varying values of grid voltage, the normally and most of the textbooks talk in terms of a load line, a single straight line. Well, that is only true if you're operating into a pure resistance. What actually happens is, just due to the hysteresis of the transformer, your so-called load line is really a load ellipsis. But now here's the important point. If 
you do not have a perfect transformer and a perfect speaker. You don't even get an ellipse. What you get is a very irregular shaped curve, which could be different on the top from on the bottom. And the reason it can be different is that in any nonlinear circuit, and whenever you introduce things like this, you're definitely talking nonlinear, the, the effects are not necessarily even symmetrical. Now, in a minute, we'll talk about push-pull output stages in an attempt to eliminate some of the asymmetry. But basically what happens in the tube is its plate load is constantly changing with frequency. And that produces distortion. Here, for example, is a chart I took from the book Fundamentals of Vacuum Tubes that plots the power output versus the second harmonic distortion, the third harmonic distortion, and the total distortion. Notice that as the uh, impedance changes, you get different amounts of distortion and you get different amounts of power out for the same input. That's what's important. So if, for example, uh, a, two instruments in music are playing and one of them is playing at a different frequency than the other, they actually get different amplification through the output stage not only a voltage amplification, but power amplification, and they each get different distortion. So that is why that the transformer in a, in a tube stage causes it to sound different from a uh, transistor output stage because it introduces these kinds of nonlinearities and these kinds of distortion. Now, I'm going to briefly touch on push-pull stages, but before I do, I would like to complete the experiment part of this by running, by rerunning that same experiment with the COS loudspeaker. I've changed the setup. Everything is basically the same, except now, instead of the uh, Panasonic loudspeaker, I'm using this COS. Uh, model M85 plus. So let's take a look at what that looks like on the impedance analyzer. Okay, now we're running. I don't know if you can hear it in the background. We are running the COS speaker and notice the difference. This COS speaker has a resonance th that reflects back into the primary it starts at 3K, just like it did with the Panasonic speaker, but it goes up to about 15K here, then it goes back down to 10K, and then back up to 15K out around 20 or 25, maybe 30 kilohertz. So, you see that you get differing uh, results and it also varies not just with the transformer, the tube, the power supply, the coupling capacitors, and all the other things that, that might be different from one amplifier to another, but also with the speaker and the speaker's effect on the nonlinearities of tube output stages. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one last thing. I'm going to lay that speaker down and rerun this. Okay, this is the same speaker. It has basically the same shape, and but look at the low end at what has happened to the impedance. It has gone up from about 3K to about 4K, uh, just because we laid the speaker on its face. Now, I showed this earlier. The reason this is important is, it's not just the fact that you have a different speaker. It literally matters where you put the speaker and what you put near it. So if a speaker is operating in free space, it has one set of characteristics. If you shove it in a corner, it has a completely different set of characteristics. And especially if you put furniture or other things in front of the speaker, then it has a third set. So 
uh, if you if you want more on this, watch Steve Gutenberg's channel, The Audiophiliac. He talks a lot about get your speakers out in the room. Anyway, let's take a brief look at push pull and then end this overly long video. So last, I'd like to touch on push pull audio amplifiers. So here is an example of a typical push pull audio amplifier. At least that's what the the caption says. But it's drawn in a rather funny way. And actually the reason is it comes from an article uh, in 1931, or I'm sorry, 33, by B.J. Thompson called Graphical Determination of Performance of Push-Pull Audio Amplifiers in the Proceedings of the Institute of Radio Engineers, which, by the way, you can download from American Radio History. Uh, dot com. Don't look for proceedings, look for IRE in the index. And uh, this is from the April 1933 issue. The You're probably more used to push-pull stages being drawn like this, where you have two tubes, a uh, split winding on the primary and then the speaker or a load on the right. But one of the reasons that I wanted to mention this article, well two reasons. One is push-pull tubes or push-pull stages tend to, to eliminate even harmonic distortion. And so a push-pull tube stage is going to sound different from a single-ended tube stage. Pentodes, of course, are going to sound different from triodes. But if you remember this graph of power output, distortion, and load resistance, the fact that a push-pull stage eliminates second harmonic distortion means that you don't have to pay attention to this curve or to this total distortion curve. Instead, you just have to pay attention to the curve of third harmonic and, of course, fifth, seventh, ninth, and so on, which are less. So, you can operate a push-pull stage down here in these lower load resistance ranges where you get much lower third harmonic distortion and reasonable power output and not worry about the second harmonic. Now, one of the things that this article is talking about is the construction of these composite characteristics for push-pull stages. I'm not going to get into that. that. That would be a full video in and of itself, or maybe two. But nonetheless, that is a part of the complication of designing a push-pull stage. But, what tends to happen is that these curves in the characteristics balance out if the tubes and everything else in the circuit is balanced. So, like I say, that's, that's a subject for another day. Before we go, I would like to clear up one uh, issue that uh, I've heard from amateur radio operators asking questions about this and students and others, and that is you may notice that in push-pull stages, they list a plate-to-plate -plate impedance that seems to be unrelated to the impedance of the side of the transformer they're connected to. So let's talk about that briefly and then close this uh, very long video. One of the puzzles that I've seen, and frankly puzzled me uh, early on, was why the plate-to-plate -plate impedance of a push-pull transformer is twice the impedance of the single side. In other words, if you have a push-pull stage and you pull one of the tubes, this tube would see two turns on this side, and I've put two turns on this side just to make it easy. A one-to-one -one ratio. So why, when you plug this other tube in, does this tube 
uh, now see a plate-to-plate -plate impedance, in other words, a total impedance across the primary, that is twice, actually four times the impedance that any single that the single tube sees. And the reason I think is a little easier to see if you redraw this transformer this way. Now, remember the fact that these two, uh, that the center tap is electrically conductive does not change the magnetic properties at all. What you actually have here are three windings on a common core. And by the way, I've, dri I've drawn the rest of the magnetic circuit because in a typical transformer, these don't go out into free space. There's a, there's a closed path of magnetic material. So what happens is just as the, the secondary reflects back into the primary, the other primary reflects into the primary as well. And remember that the, it reflects as the square, the impedance that is, reflects as the square of the uh, turns ratio. Since the turns ratio is 2, the reflection will be 4 to 1. So I hope that helps to explain the uh, uh, why that some people are confused about plate-to-plate -plate impedance in a push-pull amplifier. And if we ever do a video on push-pull amplifiers, uh, we'll, we may talk more about this. But for now, what I would like to do is close out this video. It's, got, it's at least twice as long as I wanted it to be. And uh, hope that everyone is staying safe. Hope you got something out of this and stay tuned for some future videos and please have a nice day.